way the authority became an authority, first of all, they know less than you think. And secondly, their understanding is less wise than you think. Uh, and third, they came to it by doing what you're doing, which is try to figure things out. Uh, it makes it sound like you just sort of grit your teeth and you push forward. And it's not just that. It's like a, it's a, it's it's pushing wisely on something small. I think I committed to be a mathematician only when I got to only after being at Stanford for a bit, uh, when I was in a essentially permanent job. Getting one thing out of a talk is exciting. And I feel like, yes, I, that's <laughs> one thing I know. Welcome to Math Life Balance. Today, our guest is Ravi Vakil, a professor at Stanford University working in algebraic geometry. Welcome, Ravi. I'm excited to ask you about your experience in math and hopefully ask for some advice. Great, thanks. This should be fun. Yeah, I hope so. So tell us, please, about your background and what brought you into mathematics. OK, so let's see. So I'm, I'm, I'm Canadian. Uh, I, was born in, I was born in Canada and grew up there until graduate school, uh, but I've lived in the US since. And I, and I guess I always liked puzzles and I was always uh, liked many, many different kinds of thinking. Uh, and I was lucky that I was, I got a chance to see maybe around the time I was in high school, some really beautiful things that really affected the course of my life. And I didn't decide to become a mathematician definitively until probably surprisingly late. I think if you looked at my life from the outside, it would look like my path was clear from a very young age and that it was not so clear to me. I tried to stay broad as long as possible with, with, and, uh, and really committed to mathematics fairly late in life. Did you consider other options? What would that be? I think when I was thinking about what I wanted to do, there were the range of things which didn't necessarily coincide with my ability or my uh or convention i guess the things that were so i certainly like science i like knowledge i like history uh, um, i was very interested in international relations related things uh i think probably thinking things, things like being an ambassador well certainly being an ambassador was the sort of thing that i would have found i i found quite possibly interesting until i realized better that I could not achieve what I wanted to achieve in that way. I, I entered graduate school thinking I might do a second PhD in political theory when I started graduate school. That ended, uh, that plan, it was tentative and it ended fairly quickly, but that was certainly my plan. Wow. Do you feel like an ambassador of algebraic geometry? Yes, I guess. I feel like an ambassador for mathematics, maybe. And then, but I feel like my vision of the subject is shared by many of us, but not by all of us. And it's this big hopinous uh, conversation about why we do what we do. Uh, and for me, I'm an algebraic geometer, I think by accident a little bit. I went to graduate school and uh, I was, uh, so I worked with Joe Harris at Harvard and, I, and uh, your postdoctoral advisor was a graduate student at the time, for example. Uh, and uh, I was swayed by the personality that was uh, by sort of the romance of the subject. So it was sort of, I, I came and there were some really interesting people thinking really interesting thoughts and I enjoyed it. And so I thought, oh, I want to think about this more. And that's what happened. I do remember when I was, I was maybe halfway through graduate school and my second year of graduate school, I talked to my informal, ran, allegedly randomly chosen advisor, who was Joe, uh, and said, I don't know what I want to do field-wise, but I like these various fields. And I like uh, I like thinking in this way and that way, topologically, geometrically, I like algebra, representation theory, certain kinds of other things. And he said, oh, it sounds like you should be an algebraic geometry. And I realized only in retrospect that I could have said I like 17th century French literature. I like, you know, uh, uh, and he would have said, oh, yes, algebraic geometry, that's, that's for you. Uh, but you know, but it, but but he was right. But I realized if I'd been somewhere else, I could have been something very different. And if I met someone different in high school, I might have been a physicist, or I might have been a human rights lawyer. Or I'm so glad you're saying this because this was always my impression in school that charismatic teachers are the most impactful thing for our choices uh, in terms of what we like to study. And um, but I haven't thought about it further on the university level, or like at least PhD. And now you're saying that it continues. Wow, that's interesting. But isn't that, it seems patently true, right? I mean, high school certainly is the 
key. And like the, certain high school teachers have, they change lives, right? The entire courses of people's lives uh, have been transformed. And middle school teachers, I had the great chance of, by chance and directly connecting with my seventh and eighth grade, a, a very formative teacher who taught math and English uh, and was just really an amazing uh, a person had a difficult time uh, and uh, and being able to tell him that years later people in that class still remembered him and still talked about him uh, and uh, yes it's true that I feel like who does more from uh, probably the people who in certain places taught certain mathematics to certain people have changed the course of mathematics more than through their influence than in any other way so uh, so I feel that I feel very strongly about that like, I mean when you teach when you learn something at some high, at a high level, it's not the facts they're teaching you. If you're if if it, for once you're beyond a certain point, right? It's nothing. It's it's how to think, and it's also the um, it's a revelation and inspiration rather than passing on facts. I think, and then you go off on your own. It's just inefficient to teach someone in the one hour they're in front of you. It's much more efficient to to get some idea across and then let them go off and and learn much, much faster. Yeah, I'm, I'm still friends with my middle school math teacher. And oh, very nice. I, I tell him that when he taught math to us, he would always write definition and he would write def dot and then underline it like this. And I still keep doing it in all my math notes forever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it makes a difference. I mean, I mean, and it's sad because I feel like I was lucky enough to uh, be in a place where I met certain numbers of people. I guess I just say it's sad. It's happy uh, that so many people have this opportunity, but it's also sad that things are set up in different places. So we miss lots of talent and the talent is lost or damaged fairly early on. Uh, even in middle school, uh, fortunately not here and now uh, around where I live, but in so much of the country and the world. So um, you mentioned that the main uh, thing we teach is inspiration, which is wonderful. I totally agree. But I wonder, um, so I asked uh, people on YouTube, my subscribers, to write their questions for interviews. And I realized they have much more concrete questions than the ones I'm asking. And there was a question how to come up with math questions. Oh, that like that's oh, that's like a fantastic. To me, that's the central problem as a mathematician. I, I think, and I and I realized this only. Well, no, I, that I sort of realized in graduate school. I didn't realize it was such a central question until because it's I have because there's no solution. I feel like maybe my most important role personally as a mathematician is as a PhD advisor in terms of how I am contributing. And the one key question is how do you be creative, right? How do you how do you um, like? Uh, how do you teach someone to be creative? And you don't just say, follow this recipe book. Uh, you, you do say, develop the right taste. You do say, you know, read the classics. You do say, you know, talk to your peers. Don't just blindly follow. Uh, but it's almost, I, I've heard it described as, uh, like, how does someone learn how to tell a joke? If you want to be a comedian, it's a very tricky thing, right? I mean, you can't, how do you, uh, or how do you, uh, well, how do you write a novel or maybe better, how do you compose music? This is not something you can, uh, you do study, people do study it. It's not like you can't, be, you can't learn it. You can't quite teach it, but you can put people in position in a, where they can learn it. In math, we are very good at this because we have long experience of producing new mathematicians. And it's surprisingly, I think we all might agree on, because we've come to it ourselves and uh, that you, uh, but it takes practice, practice, practice. You always have to ask questions. You can't be, uh, you have to be interested for its own sake, not for some larger, you know, it has to be something beautiful you're chasing. At the end of the day, when you've made your small, beautiful thing, you have to appreciate that small, you have to appreciate that beauty and it can't be for some larger goal. And then at the end, you might've ended up creating something huge and beautiful. It's a very social thing. I mean, I, I feel most mathematicians, the stereotypical one, is on their own, but you can only make things of great beauty in combination with others. There's very little that is done completely on, uh, very little mathematics, amazing mathematics that's done in a vacuum. It's always, if you look back in time, you can see the roots and the ground and what, it, what fertilized it. 
Mm -hmm. um, I see. So like general practice, there is no specific advice on how to what? Well, oh, oh, okay. I guess a special. No, I guess that's it was an honest right. You're right. So, asked, well, how do you actually do it? Well, I mean, the things I would, and I, I have thought hard about this. And there are different kinds of questions that require different kinds of practice, but all the practice is good. So maybe at different stages, when you are uh, early to a subject, maybe you're ten years old, or maybe you're seventy and you're thinking about physics, theoretical physics for the first time for for pleasure, you uh, you have to get practice in making questions. What makes a good question? It isn't uh, random questions or natural questions. It's something on the on the border of tractability. Uh, it's something where you have a chance of saying something and a glimpse of something much bigger. Uh, how do you get? Maybe the trickiest thing on my mind is a thesis problem because it has to be in, interesting and tractable, but not too interesting that it's already done. Uh, 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 if they were so easy, you could just give them out like candy, and you can't. You know, you have to you have to ration them carefully. You have to be something which is um, one thing you have to learn if you're going to be creative yourself is you could try to be just smarter than everyone else, and that's not how it works. You have to like that's not like that's not a route to success because instead you're looking for opportunities that others haven't seen, uh, and uh, and you do that by hearing lots of ideas, having conversations, you realize, here's this question, and um, sure, person X could have, you know, if they were thinking about this question, could also do this question, but they didn't, and they're not, and they will enjoy hearing about it from you once you figure it out, and so, uh, so, so the best sort of things are things that you realize, hey, someone should have thought of this, well, the really best things are someone should have thought of this 150 years ago, and those are like fantastic things, or that they could be things people should have thought about five years ago, in retrospect, it's obvious, right, I mean, the best mathematical, or the ideas that make you your, 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 the, your like explosions go off in your head or when you hear something, you think, ah, yes, yeah, suddenly it's all clear. That's the way, yes, of course, that's the way it is. And then uh, and it becomes just a way in, in which you think. So, so to practice that, you have to always ask questions like that. I mean, you always have to, if you understand something, you want to understand it better. Or you want to like dissolve, um, dissolve. If you have this long, big, you have this big structure in your head, you want to dissolve it away. So you remember nothing and just have a few general principles from which everything follows. So I think those are the things that require practice. And also not putting off problem solving to another day uh, and, and like do something small today. Don't just constantly prepare for your big journey that you're planning on taking in 20 years. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good one that no one had said before. <laughs> Indeed. Um, thank you. Uh, so I have another, another practical question just for myself. Uh, I wonder whether you have an algorithm for yourself or something, an instruction on how to answer emails with math questions. I'm bad at that. So I'm the wrong person to ask. Maybe I'll observe what I do in myself because I have observed it and I'm not happy with it, but uh, was... <laughs> it's good to notice uh, that if it's a substantive math, interesting questions take longer for me to ask and they wait to answer. And that is sort of, I feel guilty. I mean, there's certain kinds of questions where someone I don't know emails me out of the blue. Um, I get so much email that I, at this point, feel comfortable, well, not happy, but comfortable with ignoring large amounts. If someone wants my time, uh, my time and my attention is, is massively constrained and I feel uh, unhappy, but willing to ignore emails for that reason. But there are a lot of other emails that are the kinds of questions you're describing that I don't want to ignore and I want to answer and they're even interesting, I want to think about them. Uh, and I will put them off until I have time to think about them. And that time is not gonna come easily. So usually what happens is much later, I write back saying I haven't had to think about it, it's really, really interesting. Uh, yeah, um, so that I have less skill with. I, I, I try to explore things like, depending on who's asking the question, talking it over at a blackboard is great. And unfortunately we can't be able to do that. Or but now we can talk it over on Zoom. Um, literally yesterday, I was trying to read something and I, I didn't understand. It felt I had done to the motivation so I could, um, uh, so I actually contacted Will, Will Sawin on Discord and he wrote back to me because he'd given me this link uh, and I just started chewing over with him in public. And then I emailed uh, Barbara Pantecki who, who I couldn't just go down the road because she's in Italy. And but she's 
the most, like one of the most interesting thinkers that I, I feel like I can understand when she says things and they're very complicated. And then she wrote, and normally she's very bad at responding to email like me, uh, but she wrote back and said, you know, scribbled some notes down. I feel like you want, maybe people shouldn't be asking me, they should be asking someone who can, I, I, yeah, I mean, you ask me how to answer the questions, but don't send the questions to me. Like find your, find your, like you don't want the single best expert, right? You want the someone who, you want someone who can think about it with you uh, and who can answer the question. And I've got some go-to people. One great thing about having PhD students is I have a lot of go-to people for my former students, which is great because I know they're really smart and I, I know how to talk to them. So I feel building those relationships is really valuable. In grad school, I love the fact that people who are now, of course, much older than they were then and they're senior and have gray hair or no hair, but at the time they were, um, okay, they also had no hair, some of them, but they uh, were, but they, uh, but they had more time and they could, they could, uh, we could just sort of uh, discuss random math things and, and try to figure something out. So yeah, maybe asking an authority for an answer to a math question, if it's not like what's a reference for this is the wrong thing to do because the way the authority became an authority, first of all, they know less than you think. And secondly, their understanding is less wise than you think. Uh, and third, they came to it by doing what you're doing, which is try to figure things out um, quick and dirty. So I successfully did not answer that question. Yeah, so two in a row. First, how do you how do you uh, how do you think of good problems? Okay, that was that was not an answer. How do you answer emails about math? But okay, I, I ducked that one too. Sorry, but these questions are to think about them. They I yeah. don't I won't ask you what is the seventh Fibonacci number. <laughs> right, that's good. You have it done. <laughs> That one I can answer. It might, it might, it's like it's the wrong answer, but I would certainly at least feel like I could answer that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I wish people ask something concrete, but they ask something vague, and I have no idea what they want to hear. <laughs> well, that's a good I, good example of a bad question, right? I mean, I feel like, uh, I, and I don't mean any insult because I ask many bad questions too. The point of, but when when I realize I'm asking a bad question, I then I want to sort of improve it. Like a bad question is one that's not going to uh, like. A, the more you refine something, uh, the better it is. And it's good to ask bad questions because you can get toward a better question, right? I mean, it's not the, it isn't that you should be afraid of asking questions. You just shouldn't, you should, I mean, quite the opposite. People are very, it's, people, uh, especially in talks, emails are cheap, but in talks, people get scared or, uh, or in conversation. So you should ask a question, but then you should want to improve it. And they shouldn't, when they write to you and they don't get a great answer, they should learn something, not necessarily about you, but about the question. Maybe what one is looking for is not like the answer to your prayers when you ask someone a question, but just the next step, something, you know, I'm, I've got this far and I bet if someone told me this one sentence that I could, then I could be all set to do the next thing. I wouldn't be done, but I would, I, I, like a light bulb would go off. I'd have to think about it. Now, while you're telling this, I realized that maybe some people write vague questions because they want to make it easier to answer something, but they make me more right. confused what to answer. <laughs> it's more work to answer a vague question, right? And then, uh, and especially if you're writing to someone whose time is constrained, uh, uh, or someone, if you're writing to a graduate school student or a postdoc, their time can be less constrained, but it's on purpose. We want their time to be less constrained. I don't want them wasting their time answering vague questions. I want them wasting their time answering interesting questions that they want to. So <laughs> yes, I think vague questions, vague questions are bad. Uh, uh, questions asking how to do your very particular problem without saying why it's interesting will get ignored. Uh, it, it's much better to run into someone at a conference and have a chat. Uh, and now maybe it's possible, maybe it's harder and easier at the same time to run into them. I see, yeah. Um, so speaking of authorities, we've never met in person, but I remember that in my first year of PhD, I think I was searching through your web page for lots of good advice. And I remember getting scared from your page on the uh, requirements for a PhD students, because you say like there are many things in particular, the, the potential PhD student must have so be able to solve most of the exercises in Hartshorn or your book. And I thought, oh my God, uh, this person would never even agree to talk to me. I don't know <laughs> all this stuff. <laughs> Although to be very precise, that is to work with me. And then if someone is going to work with me, they will have to get to that stage, but they can get to that stage with me. 
So that will be, so I can, so, so that, so it's intended to be appropriately forbidding because of finiteness of time. But then again, I'm very, uh, I should say the students I've had have varied from in what they came in knowing. I myself would not have fit that at the start uh, 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 at my PhD either. So that's that seems good. But I think the right attitude is essential. Uh, the right attitude to a PhD is essential. Uh, and it, it, right, an attitude isn't just something you say. You need evidence. Like you need to, uh, you need to put up with long periods of frustration. And then someone entering a PhD program can't have evidence of that, right? I mean, in, it, it, it's a rare person who's at that age who will have spent three years working on a problem and have it fail uh, before coming to graduate school. And that's that you have to be in a very had a very strange upbringing to be in that. So somehow it's very tricky to figure a question. Here's a question for you, which is what are the things that would make a good, do you think would lead one to think that there are good prospects for success in a PhD in mathematics? And I mean that as like an honest question. What do you think? Like what are the, and I don't mean, yeah, right. I guess. Let me, what, what, let me finish my question and maybe this would sure, be an answer okay. to yours. So the thing <laughs> is, I remember being really scared uh, when, when I, when I read this in the first year of PhD and yesterday I was preparing questions for the interview and I looked again at the same web page. I read it carefully, step by step, every sentence. I agree with all what you write and I don't understand what was so scary back then. <laughs> so now it looks completely reasonable to me. Um, oh, okay, I preemptively <laughs> tried to defend myself. But, but then again, the wrong person was convinced. Like it's the person who's done her PhD who was convinced and a new exactly. PhD student was frightened. And that was bad. I don't want that. I want it to be forbidding, but not uh, intimidating, if that makes sense. Like, yeah. I, I, so, okay, so let me answer your question and then get back to what I was trying to ask about. So I think from what I understand, uh, for me as a potential advisor, the most important thing would be if the student is like passionate about math and like you know has the eyes burning and like oh this sounds cool and 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 i guess it's important for me that if i'm trying to tell them some math story that they would be like excited and you know get inspired right. it, and then one thing i've realized is you want to you want that passion to be a deep-seated passion not a superficial passion uh, but that's again fairly easy to tell, I think, uh, as to whether someone is superficially passionate about many things or deeply passionate about. Well, it could be many things, but, uh, but um, uh, so I think that's and that's hard. What you're saying is hard to catch, and there are people who do not seem to burn publicly in that way, but are yet deeply. Uh, uh, there are people who I, in retrospect, realize are deeply passionate, but do not appear necessarily to be so. I haven't quite figured it out. Um, I do think that at least different kinds of people are suited to different kinds of advisors, which makes sense. That they're, um, different kinds of advisors give problems in different ways. And it's not, I, I'm, I'm really struck at how much there's not a royal, royal road to mathematics. That it's it, it just empirically really obvious that so many great mathematicians uh, so, and so many great ideas come from people of very, such different types. And I cannot be the person I'm not. And if I'm going to be successful and produce things that I feel have value, I have to do it in the way that I can best be successful. And that's similar for my students. I feel like they should not be a mini me. I should not be a mini someone else. The goal is to try to find them, find out who they are, what their interests are, and try to put them in a position to be the best at that even when that's outside of my i'm not the best at that i can't i'm yeah uh, uh, but if they can help if they can realize how to uncover something interesting then if they keep doing that over the decades they are going to be amazing people if they're mathematicians or whatever they choose to do so i was wondering how to not make students intimidated by all your you know story of success <laughs> My, well, I guess stories of success are always misleading because they're what things look like from the outside, I think. Uh, so, of course, that's general wisdom. But I am not unhappy with, I mean, if I put up those web pages and had no students, 
uh, and drove people away who I thought were 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 really worthwhile, I would be sad. I would be very happy to have more students if I had more resources. I don't mean financial. I mean if, if I had more capacity, or you know, there's a larger group nearby, or I, you know, I. Uh, but I also have gotten a huge amount out of brilliant graduate students in other fields. Like I feel like it's it's important to be in a community as a mathematician, as a thinker. I, I, it's not just mathematicians, but maybe for mathematicians in particular, it's really valuable to not be isolated um, in uh, in your silo. Um, but now I've forgotten your question, so I, I'm not sure whether that was. Uh, oh, oh, how not to be intimidated? Yeah. Right? I get sad with things that I've watched and, and try to help build things like uh, math overflow i'm sad that there has grown up uh, uh over time a sense that people don't want to ask questions because they're afraid of something or other uh because i feel like uh, uh that's not good. i'm sad in seminars when people don't want to talk uh or don't want to come because they're afraid uh and i'm uh and when trying things like discord think trying exploring things online to try to make things freely available, I try to make notes available, try to make uh, conversations available, try to make it possible to connect with each other. I'm always, maybe I'm saying this too negatively, I'm sad when people are frightened and don't develop those communities. And, but the flip side is I'm really happy when these communities spring up and they often spring up among people who are uh, younger because they're not already invested in a particular kind of community. They're also maybe more open to trying things out um, I liked when I moved to Stanford and initially a bunch of us in the Western two time zones of North America started this community, this Western algebraic geometry community, where we would try to meet twice a year. It's a very big region. We physically see each other and we'd get to know everyone, the postdocs, the, uh, the graduate students, the visiting faculty, the, uh, someone visiting from outside to try to build a community. And I feel like trying to build a community where people feel uh, where you're sucking people in, that's how you get more and more great mathematics, right? If, it, if it's like cold and forbidding and you drive people out, that's just not good, right? I mean, that's just not fun. It's not intellectual, like it's gonna, it's gonna die. It's gonna, it's gonna die and the vine the plant will die. So I'm sad people are intimidated, but I'm happy if people feel like something scary might not be as scary. I like the things that you say are intimidating are all possible. Maybe the question is, are these things, it's with effort they're possible. And the effort is entirely possible. And as long as you don't think you have to get there in three months, uh, when people say, I'm gonna go read Hartshorn in three months and come back and I'm all set. I, 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 I can't quite say I'd write them off, but I'm pretty close to write them off if they say that. Cause I think they do not, under, they do not understand the task that they're undertaking. And if you don't understand the task you're undertaking, how can you be successful? So what do, speaking of tasks, we don't uh, understand. What do you think are the main abstractions for math students to becoming researchers? I would even say lack of community, lack of building of, of the right places. You do notice that mathematicians come from certain places more than others because they happen to be in the places where the middle schools, where you have the teachers like you had, uh, uh, or, that, or the high schools where, so it's not, a coincidence or they'll have parents who do certain things and it means it, that there's talent and possibility out there that is not reached but in we've seen well in in the former soviet union and in russia a huge collapse in mathematics is slowing down as a whole as a human endeavor uh since uh 1989 i'm not endorsing returning to the, to, to, to the Soviet Union, I'm just observing that, uh, that there's a loss in human potential. Yeah, so what you said about USSR, as far as I understand, most mathematicians left uh, yes. when the Soviet Union opened. So that's a very simple explanation to why things have. Yes, there's this romantic image I have, which may or may not be true. And I don't want my illusions to be shattered if it's not true, because I, I think it, there's something in in this image, which is that in Moscow and St. Petersburg, you would have these communities that varied from people who were 10 years old to 70 years old, where you'd have 
math circles, you have young students talking to older students, mentored by teachers, going to universities for things in the evenings uh, where they would meet uh, their, their, their undergraduates and graduate students and young faculty and the old faculty and people with white hairs and famous names would be talking to them and they would meet. And uh, in the US, high school teachers and college professors don't talk. Like that's a, uh, that's, it's, it's a very sharp line. It, that's, that's a slight exaggeration, but really uh, culturally, it's, it's really quite true. And this idea of, in that machine, uh, that community has produced so much wonderful, a, a lot of wonderful things. Uh, a lot of wonderful people have come out of that. Uh, out of those communities. And it's true if you, you have to be a little bit lucky to be in those places and those cities. But, um, uh, and I'm a little bit, I feel like there's so much to learn. And in the US, a lot is being learned, both from people who moved from Russia and, and, and sort of the replanted in foreign soil, some of the, the traditions and they become Americanized, uh, math circles, the kinds of things people do with their kids and with their friends' kids. Uh, the gradual open willingness of faculty to talk to people outside their narrow area. Uh, um, uh, it, it's it, right. I guess there's a loss and an opportunity. The opportunity is that all these things are now getting spread around the world much. Uh, and the loss, of course, is what caused the diaspora to happen. But in graduate school, that if I meet someone who got their PhD from something with a name like an oil and gas institute or some seemingly random thing, I could tell their family history and their personal history immediately. And they were obviously geniuses. And obviously it was very clear that the people who were just like them, that just merely, like they had needlessly suffered and the people near them who were not quite geniuses, but only brilliant were lost to us. Uh, Harvey, let me try to get more advice out of you now that I have the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> so you said that there are a lot of different mathematicians and they all have different tastes and whatnot. And I wonder uh, if I, for example, enjoy a lot embracing the big picture and get inspired by it, but find it really painful to understand details of any math. How to force myself to dig into detail? I, I, maybe I'll give not quite an answer first, but then lead to an answer. For me, when I was in when I was in graduate school, I I came to graduate school having not done much math because I I don't want that to come across the wrong way. Uh, in that I was, but just that I had many interests in undergrad. And when I did math, I was very serious about it. I just didn't do the nonstop. I I, I came in with much. Um, uh, if I say weaker background, it sounds bad, but on but certainly a weaker background than most of my peers. Uh, and um, then I ended up working with someone who was inspirational, uh, rather uh, rather than uh, rather than things about the details. And so the advice he would give, which maybe I shouldn't say too clearly because people will want to take it literally, is that he I would say, what book should I read to be able to think about this problem? And he said, don't. Don't read anything, just start thinking and talking to people. And if you need to read something, read it, but otherwise just start working. And then you'll find out what you need to read. And there are things he wanted me to think about and I'd ask him questions about it. And he would deny knowing anything about them. And I discovered years later, he wrote the formative paper on it. And I don't know whether he was lying to me. I think he believed what he was saying. He wrote the paper, but his understanding he didn't feel was he didn't want to uh, uh, didn't want to share uh, didn't believe it was that great an understanding uh, and so I but I other advantages Brendan Hassett was uh, 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 was my we started the same time he finished the year before me and I could ask him anything and he would uh, well he's just a an incredible person he would just tell me do examples think it's I I acquired his way of thinking from that and then. For a postdoc, my, my best mathematical idea I've ever had was to decide that I wanted to hang out with Johan de Jong, who was on paper not what someone like me would go and spend time with. I think my advisor would often send his students to work with 
Bill Fulton, who and and they'd be like a he'd be like the finishing school to polish them to become real mathematicians. And I, uh, there's this at the time he was just out of his postdoc, but he just was, as you said, like his the fire was in his eyes, and it was uh, uh, and it was just so much fun. And he, I learned from him. I would ask him questions, and I we would work things out together. He would tell me to go do something, and I would do it. So I think I I did learn that forcing myself to do small calculation. If you can't do a calculation, do a simpler version. If you can't do that, do a baby version. And at some point you can't have any shame. Like, I feel like people are like, this is such baby stuff. This is like not even the first chapter of this thing. Or this. I, I, this is really embarrassing. Like, of course we can do this. I can't, I'm not gonna do it. Uh, I think you have to have no shame or maybe take just think, but it's so neat when you see this really small example work out. And then later on you realize, ah, oh, yes, that example, because I did it and I understand it. I, uh, uh, I, I now see everything is in the in that one example. And you stare at it and you think, this is the first case. For me, quadrics in P3. Uh, I, I know I'm not supposed to use mathematical words, but hyperboloids with one sheet. Uh, in one sheet. If you stare at them, it's the first example of something incredibly important. But what thing is that? It's a first example of so many important things. Uh, yeah, and so I find myself coming back to that as the example, as something, and I find it so amazing. It's like, uh, I mean, humans love conspiracy theories because of just who we are. And that's why mathematicians, it's something, it's, it's like a conspiracy theory. It's all so many things that are mysteriously connected in, in one thing. So yeah, so small examples, that's one thing which I think is important with the student. I often find out is if they are afraid to do examples, if they, that's a bad sign, uh, especially if they are unwilling to break that habit. If they're willing to do something dumb, if they're, if they're, I don't mean they have to be good at it, right? But they just have to be able to, they have to, they can fail. I didn't say they have to be able to do small examples, but if they don't want to try it, uh, like one type of graduate student is, or mathematician, if they love the big picture and refuse to think about the small stuff and get their hands dirty, that's dangerous. Somebody who's interested only in small stuff and not, not the big picture, that's dangerous too. But there's nothing wrong with inherently starting being one of those two, as long as, as, long as you just push yourself. Like, I don't know, you, you like algebra and you don't want to think geometrically, or you're in characteristic P and you don't like the complex numbers. Just if you, if you as long as you want to like push yourself just a little bit and realize that there may be something, because then you'll discover, you may discover a metaphor you didn't know. Either they'll tell you something or even more amazing, You'll talk to someone in a different field and they're blown away by what you know. And for you, it's like obvious because in your category, in your world, this is obvious. And, and your refusal to do that small example and realize it's the same thing that the two of you are thinking about. You're, you're missing out. We're, we're missing out on some opportunity. I see. Yeah. So to push is your answer. Well, uh, yeah, but if you're pushing with other people, I mean, uh, you push, but that makes it sound like you just sort of grit your teeth and you push forward. And it's not just that. It's like, a, it's, a, it's, it's pushing wisely on something small. Uh, uh, I, I mean, one thing, a phrase I have found myself using repeatedly, if someone is trying a problem and they, they say, okay, I'm stuck. And then the question is, have you done the smallest case? Uh, and you say, well, okay, I can't do that. Well, what about a smaller one? I can't do that. And eventually there's something you could do. But if it's something you could do and you haven't done it, you are not stuck. The thing is, people are very bothered by, you figure something out and you want to know God's way of doing it. And when you do it yourself, it's messy. You have the quote, wrong solution. And people will ask things, maybe more undergraduates will ask, but graduate students were undergraduates recently too. Like, and this is the wrong, uh, okay, I can do it, but I did it the wrong way. Uh, so I wasted my time, and it's way better to have done it the wrong way than to be just told the right way. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's way better to try to do it and not succeed, and then be told than to just be told. So because then you you realize like I tried this, this didn't work. What did I miss? It's like uh, or when I was in high school, when I learned when I learned how to when I learned mathematics, often I would learn about it by writing a prop by trying to figure out a problem. I'd be stuck, and I'd read the solution, and then I'd of course, I was like, oh, what did I miss? Like, what was the thing that in, in retrospect I should have been looking for? And then once I realized what that was, I was ready to see it anywhere else it came up. Oh, maybe, yeah, maybe a small separate thing, which is uh, um, 
something which probably no one would appreciate except for the authors. Uh, uh, so uh, Karan Kalaya and Joran Kunin and I uh, wrote a book on uh, uh, on problems from the Putnam competition. And it is unlike anything else that I've done and other things out there because the entire point of it from my point of view is you learn mathematics by solving problems. Uh, and this gives you a means, a way in. And so it kind of has embedded in it much of undergraduate mathematics just in the form of problems. It isn't, uh, you don't want tricks, you don't want, you want techniques, you want perspective. You want, you want to know as little as possible to be able to do as much as possible. And I learned a great deal of what certainly would count as undergraduate mathematics in the course of writing that when I'd read their solution, their beautiful, uh, I should say the two of them are just beautiful thinkers. And I read their solutions, I think, ah, yes, that's that's fantastic. And I had a new gem to put in my cabinet in my head. So I think uh, and the more of those you collect, you're not gonna collect those unless you're trying to, unless you're like digging in the ground, right? I mean, if you're digging in the ground, if you're not gonna do that, you're not gonna find new gems. You can only go and look at other people's gems. Ravi, so now I can't, yeah. think about math, it sounds like it's all doable. <laughs> <laughs> but then it's frustrating your hands are dirty and you're like yeah and you have nothing to show at the end of the day <laughs> but it makes you want to do it at least i, I feel like it's uh, right it, it, when you get tired and lose the love for it then that's that's like that's the serious thing that happens and you have to figure out how to regain it then if you're too tired oh maybe i can ask you about that so ravi my generation has been getting mixed signals. We are told that we should work hard and we are told that we should take pleasure in research. We are told that we should take biggest care of our mental health. And we are told that the job market is getting more and more competitive. What, is, like, what should we do with this all like pressure versus non-pressure thing? How to find the balance? <laughs> I don't think there's any difference, of course, between now and uh, there are differences, but it's all a matter of degree, and there have been worse times and better times. So, uh, so these are universal questions, not really special to this time. Let me tell you a couple stories that were helpful to me. One thing is that some people perhaps do best in competitive situations when the pressure is on. I am a non-competitive person, but a, an ambitious person. If that, and I realized at some point that the I, I'm ambitious, not necessarily for myself, but in general, and I work much less well in competitive situations. Uh, and I, I wonder whether that's true of lots of people, in which case the competitive job market is not, it, it doesn't help, it hurts, uh, right? And so uh, one pleasant thing I, uh, uh, one advantage I had at the sort of graduate school is I had no strong commitment to finishing. Um, it, uh, and uh, um, so I had an exit and I felt much better. And there are various times in my life when maybe I felt more stuck. And then when I realized I could apply to law school or I, I could consider other jobs, even when I didn't check, take those options, the fact that I had the options and that I was doing it by choice took a lot of pressure off of me and made me happier about it. If I'm doing what I'm doing by choice, it's very different than this is all I can do. And mathematics it's incredibly beautiful but culturally the previous generation has got us into this narrow thing of if you are not a research mathematician you are an apostate you're a failure you you're you're giving up your your birthright uh and uh i understand where the feeling comes from but it's wrong it's horribly wrong and on so many levels so i think knowing you can do something else and that if you are someone who can be a mathematician who can start graduate school, uh, then you have this amazing superpower. What you will do with it will depend by what, on what's available and how lucky you are. But you will do something, you can do something really interesting with it. Uh, it helped me when I began my tenure track job that I also, again, realized that trying to stay is not the point. Uh, I had to somehow take joy and I had to have some larger picture uh, in mind. And I feel like mathematics is similar that way. The other thing is, at, there are a number of stages where I would not, I was not sure whether I would, I think I committed to be a mathematician only 
when I got to only after being at Stanford for a bit, uh, when I was in that essentially permanent job. Uh, and that's because I didn't know what it was to be a mathematician. And I decided that as long as it was fun, I would keep doing it. And then it made me more willing to give up the non-fun parts. Uh, and it also made me appreciate that if I have a choice of doing this or that, I would choose the fun part. Uh, and it also helped me remember why I'm doing mathematics. Because if it's, you know, if you if you want to make a lot of money, you should not be an academic with the same skill. This isn't just math, but it's very much in math. The people leaving math, academic math will, by common measures, do far better. Uh, and but they're not the they're not the ways in which we measure things, which is one of the reasons why we why some people call them apostates when they when they when they leave, uh, especially when they're successful. Then they there's the most 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 bio reserve people who leave academia and then end up being wildly successful. That's uh, whereas I, I think it's like fantastic that what we do. I don't just mean algebraic geometry. It's very much math majors. Right? Uh, here's a question, which is, what's the purpose of a math major? And for many places, for some places, the purpose is to produce feature research mathematicians, usually pure mathematicians, ideally algebraic geometers. Uh, or you could think that this is such a powerful way of thinking. If you learn how to think in this way, it's the kind of way you want to teach people when they're in sixth grade onwards. And the people who have this have superpowers. You want math majors who will go and take over the world. And like 1% of them will become pure mathematicians and they will be brilliant and we'll be very happy to have them. And others will go off and do PhDs and other things and start new fields of, of, of like, the people who start new fields are mathematicians, they're not petroleum engineers. And then most of the rest will go and dominate the careers they go into because they have this advantage in thinking that's so much better than what other people have. That, that uh, So this is, uh, but that's a very expansive, you have to be very comfortable in your own skin if you want most of your students to be different than yourself. But I think we should be open to that. And now I forgot what the question was. I kind of, okay. I have no idea what question would lead to that answer. But it was a, it was a really good question. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it's not a question of, you're not planning your retirement. Like plan B doesn't mean, what will I do in 20 years? It just means what why I do in three years. And it's not, and it could be if you enter some industry, it isn't, I mean, I don't know if I like it. I, I, I have some friends who like it uh, and uh, maybe I will, maybe I won't, but you're not signing anything in blood any more than you sign something in blood when you begin your PhD, right? I mean, you're not promising to finish. Well, when you take a job, uh, 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 you're, you're absolutely not promising. You're promising to turn up and to teach for a year or do whatever you're doing, but you're not promising that you'll stay for five years. You're allowed to go on to something else after that. And that re relieves, we're just so used to having only one path and maybe it, convincing people there's no exit helps produce more mathematicians in some sense, but only in the short-sighted way. In the long-term you get way more mathematicians by having it a place where people, I want more people to go to graduate school and think interesting thoughts and ideally be successful after in lots of things. And the more options they have, the more better mathematicians will have too, right? I mean, does that not make sense that you want more, the more smart people you bring in? And you're only going to bring them in if they have more directions to go afterwards so they have, they don't feel trapped. Yeah, I think being raised in Russia, the concept of freedom of choice was not quite conveyed to us as much. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, but, but, I, but I don't think it's just, I think here in maybe, I don't know why, but it's in the mathematical culture across the world, I think, kind of what matters. I, I mean, applied mathematicians are looked at already, you're an apostate. I think there's this period decades ago when, I don't know why we do this, but the pure mathematicians kicked out, I mean, there are these divorces of math departments across the world between pure and applied. The divorces are ugly. They're not, like they were, it was, and it makes no sense to me. This is part of my romantic image of what people uh, the style of learning mathematics in Russia is perhaps, but uh, but th there's uh, mathematics for centuries has thrived because of the interplay between pure and applied mathematics. And it doesn't mean I need to be an applied mathematician. It like I'm not saying therefore I should be an applied mathematician or I should have applied interest. That's not what I mean at all. But I shouldn't be cutting them off. I shouldn't. Uh, I I, sh I should at least want applied mathematicians 
to have strong education in pure mathematics. And that secretly means I should think pure mathematicians when they're surely like the differential equations that come up. Uh, the Fourier the analysis, is that pure or applied? I don't know. It's these artificial barriers which make us weaker intellectually. So, uh, but we also kicked out computer scientists. We kicked out, um, we kicked out physicists earlier. We kicked out uh, statisticians from our community. We're purists. So like, uh, and I feel like that's not good for us. I feel like we should have a very, like if we're, if we're really interested in science, which I, I feel like mathematics, I'm not gonna argue whether it's a science or not. It's all definitional, but it's, uh, but the kind of person who's interested in mathematics is gonna be interested in theoretical computer science. Is it the same thing? And theoretical physics, a lot of things, math, theoretical mathematicians are interested. Applied math are things that, frankly, theoretical mathematicians, so much cool stuff that comes up there. It's not a coincidence that the world has this structure which pure mathematicians would love. Because that's, it's, that's, it, it, the stuff that comes out of people's heads that's not connected to anything, that's the most boring math there is. I mean, algebraic geometry is, is the amazing parts of it are the parts that are totemic and nature, like they're, they're the language of the universe, right? They're, they're the kinds of things. That's what's interesting. Not that we made up some dry rules that you that you kind of manipulate. That's not what's interesting, right? That's what's a, so. Uh, um, and there's a reason why so many great mathematicians have in field X started off in field Y because they didn't they they uh, brought something new in that way. So it's a uh, so I think. Uh, it's not that we should raise our PhD students so they can learn, you know, that plan B isn't like a you fail, goodbye. Plan B is this is interesting too. Uh, and uh, and it, given already that you should not be spending 24 hours a day doing math because it's bad for your math, that kind of applies more generally too. If you want a better mathematician, you want someone who's, I, I want lots of mathematicians engaged in our university, mathematicians are not engaged in the wider university very much, whereas other disciplines naturally are. I think that's unnatural. I think like the single most connected subject in the university is math, right? I mean, is there any subject that is more connected to other subjects than mathematics? That's an honest question. Can you name one? <laughs> no, it's all, it's, yeah, no, name, what, what's the competitor? Ravi, I don't know, but your idealistic picture of the world is just so wonderful. <laughs> no, but it, 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 the good thing is that this is not a. If you ask the, the question, the, is, is there anything more? Is there any more central subject that would be? I mean, if there is, you should be able to name one. Or what's a competitor? What's a contender? Literature. Literature is highly connected. Yes. Yeah, so that absolutely, that's something which should be. Uh, it's at least arguably. Uh, good. You're, I feel like you're thinking in the right way. It's 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 these are totemic, central things. Maybe let me ask you one more practical question. So you write on your webpage a lot about attending talks, and I've always struggled with. I mean, I do attend many talks because just with the, the optimism you are speaking, I every time hope that this time I'll be able to understand something. I wonder, do you have any life hacks how to follow math talks? Is it is it really true that it hasn't gotten? Like, are you getting nothing, or are you sad that you're only getting twenty percent? Uh, maybe your standards are too high. I think uh, I think like the cons the way math talks are designed are for very concentrated people. I'm a very distracted person, so I easily get distracted, and then when I get back to the blackboard, I can't follow, and then I get like distracted again. So how to you how to jump up that horse? Like, right. Let me get back. Right. Well, let me first say that the way you phrased it is right uh, in term. And the one thing is that most of the audience is like us uh, and gets distracted. And it's I think it's a myth that most do not. And one clue about this is that when people feel comfortable talking about it, which usually tends to be when they're younger, or when they're older and talking about their own personal experience, everyone says this. No one is saying, I wish uh, the talk was more like a book, uh, where it was like, uh, uh, books are designed, talks are designed to communicate information a certain way. And books are designed 
to give information in a different way. And, it, and articles are designed. So what you're describing is our weaknesses of the talk giver. And what you're saying is, uh, how do you get something out of an imperfect talk, knowing that all talks are imperfect uh, uh, and no talk will be perfect. And you, despite that, are learning how to do this. And you must have done this before. Maybe you were younger when you did this because, to, because of where you were, but learning how to read mathematics is similar. It's incredibly dense uh, and it's very hard and it's an acquired skill. And even at the end, you're not reading it like a novel, uh, nor should you. But even at its best, like the best mathematics is, is, is right. So how do you get, I, I, I feel like if I get something out of a talk, I'm happy. And my, that, that's like, a, it's such a low bar. But, if, but it is true that I, if I go to enough talks, I, I should say going to a gazillion talks is a dangerous thing some graduate students do. Like they sit there and they, they feel good about themselves and they maybe learn some fancy word. But if I go to some talks and I get one thing out of every talk, which is, I, I won't always get, but sometimes I get multiple things out of a talk uh, and zero out of other talks, then it adds up. Like, I feel like that's the thing you don't see adding up over time until at some point you realize uh, that it does. So, so if you're thrown and there's no hope, then it's time to just doodle and do stuff on your own. But if there's something, like if, if you're like, okay, at this point I've lost the thread. I don't even know why you're doing what you're doing. I'm just gonna try to find something in this talk that I can, at this point, in the rest of the talk, like one fact, one thing. And if there's absolutely nothing that sucks, but maybe there's someone else in the talk you know and you can lean over and ask a definition or something. Or if you're on Zoom, you could do it during chat. Um, no, do it in chat. Yeah, we've experimented in the algebraic in the Stanford algebraic geometry seminar as like a Discord chat, which I think works for like a really small number of people, but it works for me. I mean, I've I've been able to ask questions and get people and get answers for myself. Um, so from what I gather, if you like, if you're on a talk and in the beginning you understood what's going on, but then you can't follow anymore, you don't feel upset about it. I'm more upset if the speaker doesn't try. Like, uh, but. Uh, but if I get something and I, um, there are also things where I think I'm getting something I've learned that I'm not really, if I, if like a, a day after the talk, I don't remember anything that's bad, uh, that, like that's, uh, so, you know, writing down the theorem and underlining it and putting a square around it, that doesn't count because I'm not going to remember the theorem, but if I remember what the big problem is or what the, or yeah, I feel like that's, that, then I feel happy. I think, yeah, having low standards helps. Uh, and then also looking for hooks to get back into the talk um, where, uh, I mean, then you become acutely aware of bad talks where there's something where explicitly due to the notation, you, you know you're gone. There's no coming back. Uh, and there's a, uh, yeah, no, no, I, th I think maybe your standards are high, but I do suspect you're getting more out of it than you did when you started graduate school, for example. Uh, maybe you think maybe you think it's because because you know more. I don't know when you if you are learning Spanish and you visit Spain and you hear it in the air around you, it helps even if you can't put your finger on it. As opposed to if you're sitting in a classroom uh, and and everyone is repeating the same words at the same time. So I think hearing people talk about it fluently and maybe if the speaker's excited, right? The fact you said right. If, People are excited. You hear the questions people ask, and you hear people like, "Oh yes, what about this?" You know, that like, I feel I'm getting some culture then about like, when, uh, if I hear something, think, "Oh yes, that's a big deal," or, or "Okay, that's kind of expected," or "I bet someone's going to ask this question," or "Maybe I'll ask this question even if I don't know what it means." Uh, then, then I feel like you've gained something. If you gained something, then that's hopefully better than. Yeah, I think that's. You know, if I can learn a little bit every day, it's, I get frustrated when days go by and I can't have any new idea, like when there's no time to do anything. That's frustrating. Getting one thing out of a talk is exciting. And I feel like, yes, I, that's <laughs> one thing I know. You have a good life perspective. <laughs> <laughs> Having low standards is good. Is, is always a good, <laughs> a good advice for life. Makes you do a high level job. So, um, <laughs> Ravi, there is only one thing I knew about you before this interview, and that is that you are the most highly desirable interviewee uh, because I've been getting emails requesting an interview with you. So why why is it so? Why do people want to interview with you? <laughs> this I have no idea. Maybe <laughs> maybe people know my name because of the notes I put out. I, I really don't know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, 
let me ask you the last question. What is your wish for young mathematicians? Finding joy and happiness. I guess that's good in general. And then mathematically as well. Like I feel like we're part of a, one of the reasons I love being a mathematician, a central reason is the people. And we are part of this very long conversation since long before we're born and long after we die of this, uh, of this very beautiful thing and the chance to experience it and to understand things well enough to see these amazing beautiful things and then to be able to construct beautiful things yourself and make them like a crafts like a craftsman uh, and yet also see the ma major artists as well and to sh to show each other our things and show our work is there's a a great joy in that that you can get lost that you can lose in the rush and hustle and bustle of needing to make a living and having a life and so many other things that happen so i, I I think the main thing is finding and holding on to that to that joy and that beauty.